uh, when people outside of the academy asked me what I'm working on, I can't exactly say medieval mice because I can see in their faces the look that's forming and, and what they're thinking. And what they're thinking is, this is a good reason to defund the universities. <laughs> to be really careful with this stuff. Oh, Richard, 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 this mousy paper does not offer a sufficient tribute to what you've meant to me as a, a colleague and a friend. You've improved my work, and you've considerably brightened my life. So thank you, thank you. Uh, the handout should be coming around here. Um, mice appear in many medieval texts, but as when seeking them out in our houses, we must often expose their hiding places to bring them to light. Not surprisingly, in the Middle Ages, Mice had a very bad reputation as invaders of human space, as pilferers and contaminators of people's food, and as instigators of fear quite disproportionate to their tiny size. Indeed, medieval culture's intense <coughs> disapproval of mice was shared by all members, all, all stations, uh, from the mightiest theologians to the poorest peasants, and all of them felt strongly enough about this animal to leave behind traces of their disdain. Mice appear in medieval biblical commentary where, for example, they are explicitly left off the ark. <laughs> in medieval Eucharistic theology where they eat the consecrated host with enormous theological consequences. <laughs> In hagiography, where saints become handy mouse repellents, <laughs> in chronicles, in folklore, and in literary texts of all kinds. Even St. Francis, the lover of furry little creatures, drew the line at mice. Um, he saw them as a scourge sent by the devil to try his patience. <laughs> This paper, though, is going to turn to mice in the fable tradition, focusing on a single fable, the mouse and the frog, a fable inherited from classical antiquity, but greatly embellished upon in the medieval period, in versions by Marie de France, John Lydgate, Richard John Lydgate, and Robert, and Robert Henryson. Seeing the mouse in this fable as a mouse rather than just as a human in a mouse costume clarifies not only the ethical dimensions of the fable itself, but also tells us much about medieval folk conceptions of habitat, speciation, and the presence of a food chain that included both animals and humans within it. Originally, a, a wild grassland animal from the dry steppes of Eastern Europe and Central Asia, the mouse attached itself to humans some 10,000 years ago when humans began to turn from hunting and gathering to agriculture. With agriculture came the storing of grains and cereals, the mouse's staple foods. In 1983, it was estimated that mice and rats destroyed 20% of the worldwide human food supply. And if you bear that modern percentage rate in mind, which was reached in spite of all of our toxins and technologies, you can imagine how much more of the medieval food supply was eaten by these rodents. Moreover, mice will eat a great variety of things. Although they prefer starch-filled seeds, they will eat fruit, vegetables, insects, nuts, meat, cheese, candles, soap, shoe leather, paper, parchment, upholstery, cloth, paint, and glue. <laughs> Mice are also extremely fertile. Every 20 to 30 days, adult females, and by that I mean females of 25 days old, okay, can have litters which average five to seven in number after a gestation period of only 19 days. The common house mouse, <laughs> the common house
house mouse, Mus musculus domesticus, found throughout Western Europe, lives exclusively in buildings and is thus totally dependent on humans for its survival. But other species live in close proximity to humans. Harvest mice live in areas with tall vegetation, such as wheat fields or corn fields, and wood mice a major threat to crops during harvest time in the United Kingdom, live along fields but near enough to forested areas to have access to their main wintertime food, acorns. In short, mice and humans compete directly for food, an ecological fact that would have had serious economic consequences for medieval communities living on the edge of survival. As a result, medieval people thought very carefully about this animal's behavior, its bodily characteristics, its nutritional requirements, and its habitats. They also expressed very strong desires to keep the animal outside of human spaces, arguing in a variety of ways that the mouse doesn't belong there, and that in entering human habitations, it actually violates natural law. In the beast fables, to which I will now turn, these attitudes are very strongly expressed. When animals in fables cross natural boundaries, for example, by moving outside of their perceived habitats, or when they otherwise engage in behavior, behavior inappropriate to their natural identities or to what humans want their natural identities to be, they become available for moral punishment. For fables tend to be conservative, not just on ethical and social issues involving humans, but on those involving animals as well. Just as people should not pridefully strive to transcend the social stations to which they were assigned at birth, so animals should remain content with the habitats in which they belong. In fables about mice, for instance, very clear judgments are made about this animal's various living arrangements and methods of food procurement, and punishment always awaits the mouse who invades human space too confidently, who becomes what was wittily, I think very wittily, described by some of the fabulists as a resident alien in human territory. Even in fables in which the mice are shown to be sympathetic victims of larger animals' predation, or in which the mice are said in the allegorical morals to stand for good things, like the human soul or the patient poor, there is often nonetheless an attempt to contain the mice, suppressing readerly sympathy for them by hinting at their bad habits of invading human space. The fable I wish to examine today is subtle though insistent in its attention to mouse habitat. This fable, The Mouse and the Frog, is one of the most common in medieval fable collections. In its barest essentials, the story goes like this. A mouse wants to cross a river and it seeks help in doing so from a frog. The frog suggests that the mouse tie its foot to the frog's leg with a piece of thread, and then the frog um, can pull the mouse safely across the water. Well, as soon as the animals reach midstream, however, the frog intentionally submerges, drowning the mouse. So the frog is clearly the bad guy in, in this story, right? And, and, and he was all the way through the classical period. A kite, kite up above, sees the mouse's floating corpse and it swoops down to grab it, taking with it the attached frog. <laughs> so both animals come to a grisly end in the claws and ultimately the stomach of the mouse's natural enemy. Now the moral of this story varies from version to version, but the usual moral is that he who deceives an innocent person will become ensnared in his own trap and come to a bad end. And I've given you at the top of your handout one of these very terse Latin versions 
um, used in medieval schools of, of this fable. It really is, is quite terse. Sometimes, sometimes the moral is given uh, Christian dimensions, and the frog is said to be the body, the mouse is the soul, the kite is the devil, uh, with the story then illustrating um, how the body wickedly drags down the soul until both are snatched by the fiend at the end. Nonetheless, it's very, very clear in this simple fable that our ethical sympathies are to lie with the mouse. I mean, the fable sort of suggests that. Yet the mouse is very swiftly killed, even though it seems to have done nothing wrong, aside from being taken in by the frog's apparent sincerity. This fact alone might be telling us something about medieval people's low threshold of tolerance for mice. I mean, no matter how unjustly it perishes, a dead mouse is always better than a live one. <laughs> but in amplifying this fable, medieval writers, especially in the vernacular, sought to make the, moral, uh, the story more morally satisfying by blackening the character of the mouse even more to sort of justify its coming to such a tragic end. And they did so by elaborating on the mouse's biological tendency to inhabit, in medieval terms, invade human spaces. The character of the mouse is embellished by elaborating on the mouse's desire to cross that river in the first place. As medieval people knew, okay, real mice, and this is quite true, real mice are naturally averse to water, and they avoid its perimeters out of instinctual fear. The fable mouse, then, in medieval people's eyes, is already taking foolish chances by overstepping its natural boundaries, by hankering, as is the creature's want, to encroach upon somebody else's habitat, this time the frogs. In most early Latin versions of this fable, the mouse's reason for wanting to cross the river is, is never specified. In general, these early Latin fables are very, very terse, as that first one shows you. Yet slowly but surely, as the fable makes its way through time and across Europe, the fable redactors begin to embellish upon the mouse's motives for wanting to cross the river. And these motives clearly relate to the animal's perceived tendency to wander into the habitats of others without being invited or being welcomed. In this sense, the river in the fable, and I'm thinking about Alistair's paper, paper, paper here too, crossing that river, not a good thing. The river in that fable symbolically symbolically represents a boundary that the mouse insists on transgressing to the chagrin of the medieval community. The vernacular fabulists are the most inventive and the most attuned to the environmental issues at stake here. Yet modern commentators have overlooked the focus in these poems on the environmental transgressions of their mouse protagonists, thus misreading the works, I think, or at the very least, finding ethical ambiguities they can't resolve with respect to what the reader's attitude is supposed to be concerning the mice, their living arrangements, and their project of crossing the river. It's thus worth our while, I think, as literary critics, as well as historians of nature, to pay attention to those details in the texts under examination by focusing resolutely on the mice as mice. Marie de France is one of the first to provide a detailed habitat and a set of morally questionable motives for the doomed mouse. Marie's mouse has taken up residence in a mill house over which she presides as Dame de la Maison, <laughs> I am the lady of this place. She arrogantly flaunts her social position during a conversation with the passing frog. All here is under my subjection, she brags. Got those lines on your handout. And she then serves the frog a fancy meal made up of food she has stolen from the human mill owner. Okay? 
the frog feels uncomfortable out of its own natural habitat, and it makes a remark suggesting that it misses having water to drink with the meal, and when no water at all is forthcoming, the frog convinces the mouse to come to its own monsoon <laughs> in the swamp, <laughs> where things are even more bell than in the mill house. <laughs> the mouse, the mouse drawn to the prospect of dining even more spectacularly, foolishly agrees to go, and the water tragedy unfolds. <laughs> well, although the mouse actually escapes in Marie's version, hers and those based on hers are, are the only versions to spare the mouse from death at the end. She really reproaches this creature. First, for believing that it had signori over human space and goods that were not its own. And second, for risking its life out of a greedy desire to taste even more luxurious food than it already had, food paid for by someone else and served up on someone else's home turf. For, for Marie, then, the mouse's punishing adventure in the water is definitely brought on by an overstepping of natural bounds, which began before the story commenced, when the mouse moved into human premises. Now, Robert Henryson also tells the fable in such a way as to impute to the mouse some very bad, indeed, habitat-jumping motives for crossing the river. In his version of the story, the mouse, crying loudly for help at the riverbank, attracts the attention of a resting paddock, and for him it's a toad in his story. The toad actually expresses surprise to see a mouse so close to the water, and the toad says, what is your errand here? Okay, very quizzically asking. The mouse replies by saying that across that river, she can see corn, oats, barley, peas, and wheat. This is the mouse paradise, right? And she says she'd like to go over there because she's tired of the hard nuts, she says, that she has to gnaw with her teeth. The nuts being here, of course, her customary natural diet out in the wild. I think this is definitely a wood mouse aspiring to be a harvest mouse. <laughs> Let's look at Henryson's lines here. I've got them on your, on your, hand, on your handout. Seest thou, quote show, of corn, young jolly flat, of reap agents of barley, peas, and wheat? I am hungry, and fun will be thereat. But I am stop it, be this water great. And on this seed, he get nothing till eight, but hard notice. Whilst with me teeth he bore, where he beyond me faced, where fed the more. <laughs> Thus Henryson makes explicit that the mouse has no business leaving its dry meadows and woodlands in search of something better, something in this case grown with the human investment of hard work and much time. I mean, these are human crops. Crossing the river is tantamount here to crossing over from wild natural space into humans' rightful territory. Before the fable has barely begun then, the mouse has earned its medieval reader's disapproval and scorn. Henryson embellishes the theme of natural habitat by stressing that the toad is comfortable in her own environment. She's a creature whilk be nature could duck and gaily swim. Moreover, Henryson has the mouse marvel aloud at the toad's specific physiological appropriateness to its watery environment. Let's look at our handout again. This is the mouse talking. E hath marvo, then quote the little moose. Who can do flat without feather or fin? This river is so deep and dangerous. May think that thou so drawn to wait therein. Tell me, therefore, what faculty or gin thou has to bring thee over this water wand. Well, in response to the mouse's request for such information, 
the toad replies with a scientific lecture on those anatomical qualities she possesses that allow her to navigate her habitat easily. And here's another quote on your handout. handout. With me toi fait, coche, look on and red, instead of airless, he roar the strain full still, and thought the brim be perilous to wade, faith to and fra he swim at me on will. He may not drown, for we me open gill, devoid as all the water we receive, therefore to drown for sooth ne, ne dread he hath. Well, I mean, this short exchange between the mouse and the frog is instructive indeed. The, the mouse is configured here as a creature totally ignorant of differences between animals and thus animal forms. Her questions strongly suggest that she sees the toad as just another mouse, the one that has some special equipment, some faculty or gin, allowing it to navigate a strange environment. By showing such ignorance of how God has designed animals' bodies to suit their specific niches, the mouse gives us the sense that she's never once stopped to think about natural identity, nor has she considered the vanity of the project of assuming that all others living in the world are just slightly different versions of herself. And I'm, I have a word for this. I've coined it neurocentrism. It's <laughs> <laughs> but she thinks that you know all these creatures, they're all just versions of herself, and their habitats and their possessions are there for her invasion and enjoyment. Um, I've got some more on the other side of your handout, right on top, a little bit, little line from Henry Sen. This is um, the, the toad talking. This difference in form and quality, our mystic god has caused the nature to print and set in every creature. So the mouse just doesn't get this. <laughs> Moreover, by assuming that she can you know, very easily cross that river to enter the fields on the other side, the mouse blithely disregards the God-given demarcations of her own identity in order to adopt a new identity in a new environment, moving, as it were, from being a nut-eating woodland creature to being an amphibious creature, and finally to being a consumer of cultivated grain in the human environment across the river. The mouse's failure to understand the concept of natural bodily identity, and thus niche, shows that this creature is a boundary crosser, one which brings upon itself its watery death by assuming it can occupy and then feed from humans' cultivated fields. Moving to John Lydgate, Richard Lydgate, Lydgate. John Lydgate's version, his version of this fable is also amplified in order to provide motives for the mouse's entrance into the water. Lydgate follows Marie de France's version of the fable fairly closely, but he develops the character of the mouse in some new directions. He begins his fable with a longish prologue on the subject of deceit, and those familiar with the fable's general plot will surely suppose, as they read the prologue, that he's got the frog's behavior in mind. And indeed, at the end of the fable, the moral of the story enlarges on the frog's deceitful actions. But as one gets to know the nature of the mouse in this story, it becomes clear that Lydgate also views this creature as a paragon of deceit who uses dissembling rhetoric to cover up its theft of human food and to create an ethos about itself that is just a tissue of lies. Lydgate's frog, according to its custom, that's Lydgate's word, lives by the river. The mouse sojourned, that's, that's Lydgate's word, at a mill. And I'd like you to notice the difference then in the way these two animals live. One sticks to its natural habitat, the other is on some temporary visit, a sojourn, to somebody else's, a human's habitat. 
The mouse proudly invites the frog in to tour its palatial millhouse dwelling, shows the frog the hopper, the trough, the millstone, the corn sacks. That is everything um, in that mill, uh, the human-owned mill, that enables the mouse to have access to refined forms of grain. Afterwards, the mouse, to show its gentility, serves up a fancy meal of stolen flour and wheat. And she brags, and turn to your hand out here, here is me lordship on dominosium. He live here easily, out of noise and strife. This close all whole is in me subjection. Okay. After this arrogant and self-satisfied display of wealth and leisure, the mouse's speech takes a really strange and interesting turn. The mouse begins to poor mouth its condition. And I've got some of some of the gates of poor mouthing here in your, on your handout. It just goes on really quite long. Sufficient is me possession, she said. Better is quiet than trouble with riches. Blessed be poverty. Nature is content with full little thing. And no man is more afraid than glad povert with small possession. And the poor man merry in his cottage, as is the merchant in his stuffed hoose. <laughs> and this little mill fint me me vitale, and the plumen glad with button and potage, and though that I beg but a little moose, you know, and it just goes on and on and on. The mouse also cites two proverbs that are mordantly ironic, given its own habits of stealing people's food stores. Quote, a poor man that is with little pleasant, labours truly be may, at nicht merrily sleep for any fair or famous. <laughs> and what God sendeth, it is to the poor man's pleasance. I mean, there's no laboring going on here. Um, well, the mouse isn't working. And nor is God the one who's sending the mouse its flour and meal. You know, it's the human mill owner who's doing that. Thus, Lydgate's mouse is a really deceitful actor, hiding its vanity and greed under the pose of virtuous poverty. And here, I really think, um, I mean, lots of critics think that Lydgate just lost track of what he was doing. And maybe, Richard, maybe you think that. <laughs> but I really think what Lydgate's doing is kind of interesting. He's um, comparing mendicant, mendicants, prior mendicants, to the mouse. Because, you know, they get into your house, too, and they take your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they take your stuff, and then they talk about how poor they are. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he never has to say it, and he's just, it's just all here in the mouse. Well, right before the mouse is enticed into the water by the frog, Lydgate briefly but tellingly sums up the two contrary living arrangements of these animals. And I put this couplet on your handout. The frosh deleteth to a bead in mori lacus. The moose to feed him on chaise and tender cockes. Okay, so that about sums it up. And although Lydgate doesn't finally approve of either of these rascals, and he calls them both warmest, which is the word for vermin, okay, the couplet just quoted actually temporarily takes the frog side. Um, and nobody ever did that in the fable tradition. You know, he really does sort of prefer the frog. The frog knows and prefers its watery, natural habitat, but the mouse is ever the resident alien lurking in the vicinity of somebody else's food stores far away from its natural environment. Well, in addition to the fable of the mouse and the frog, there are other fables, obviously, that feature mice, some of which meditate very closely on species differences between the various kinds of mice living in proximity to humans. For example, the town mouse and the country mouse, fascinating study of speciation in the medieval mind. Um, in, in that um, medieval versions of that story, the, the, the fable so carefully observes dietary distinctions visible in different species of mice. One's a wood mouse in, in that fable, the other's a house mouse. 
But this topic needs to be saved for a longer version of my essay, because to address it today, I think, would be to risk what I have very nearly already accomplished, namely creating a mountain that gives birth to a mouse. <laughs> it's really enough now to say that the work of the medieval fabulists is closely attuned to the mouse as a biological creature. I'm thus ready to quibble with those critics who say, and I'm going to quote one here, one makes sense of a beast fable not by appealing to zoology, but by appealing to the social categories the narrative imposes on its animal characters, end quote. Well, I mean, to be sure, fables are primarily vehicles for conveying social and ethical information about humans, but I think folk zoology is often a crucial component of the medieval fable tradition. And in the case of the mouse, the fabulists saw this animal as wickedly transgressive of its natural God-given boundaries, and any mouse who wandered out of its niche to compete with humans for food deserved every bit of the punishment and bad luck that came its way. Thank you. <laughs>